Okay, welcome to the 73rd episode of An Evolving Man. Today, I'm really excited to be speaking to Richard Grannon. Richard is an author of the book, The Cult of One. I'll just bring that up. Um, and he's passionate about helping others defend themselves, get back on their feet, and finally free themselves from narcissistic abuse, drawing on numerous forms of psychotherapy, including NLP, CBT, Zen meditation, psychodynamic, psychodynamics, and more. Grannon's unique methodology offers a direct practical solution to help narcissistic abuse victims reclaim their self-worth. Thank you, Richard. Sounds good. Sounds sounds like a useful chat, whoever that chat is. <laughs> I think, yeah. So one of the ways I love to to begin the uh, the podcast is just for you to introduce a bit about how you got into the work you're now doing. Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, the The platform for doing it through the internet came about because I was a taxi driver and a doorman working in Liverpool. And I started to get interested in internet marketing and I wanted to have an online business. And I started teaching self-defense online which martial arts is a, is a passion, lifelong passion. Um, and that actually, actually did quite well. It flourished. Uh, I got on, I think, six months after YouTube was born, I had my first YouTube channel. And uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the whole, the whole process, the whole procedure. Around that time, I shifted um, out from taxi driving and door work, which I was, I was only ever involved in whilst I was waiting to join the army. Uh, and that wait became a perpetual one. I was supposed to join the army as an officer from the age of 21. Uh, but for various reasons, I, I, I didn't. Um, and then I shifted gears. A friend of mine, offered, he was a professional public speaker, said, would you like to go into schools and talk to unruly teenagers? Mm -hmm. And I said, for the love of God, no. That sounds <laughs> awful. I'd rather be skinned alive. And um, he said, don't worry, they'll do that for you as well. So I, I tried it a couple of times. And um, I loathed it and I was terrible at it. And uh, I decided uh, contumaciously and confrontationally to, to, to break it, to find a way to win these kids over. And that began like a five-year sort of mini career. I was self-employed, but I had an agency where it got to the point where I was saying uh, I'd be doing four schools a week, but all over the country. So the people who set me up would be like, oh, you're in West Yorkshire. And then tomorrow you're in Devon. I would drive to all these places. It was crazy. Um, and that really uh, gave me more of a love of, of public speaking as a procedure, um, but also the impact I could have on a room full of kids who had serious problems. So some, some had very serious problems inside of six hours of talking to them. And I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Um, and basically what happened was the, the self-defense project segued into a personal development project um, after a period of time. And the people within that personal development project, the, the, the market, my YouTube audience, were all asking me to talk about narcissism. As I began talking about narcissism, I told them I don't know anything about this. And I'm not interested. It's not my, my background in psychology refuted personality disorders. Both schools that I was trained in were like, this is nonsense. You don't need to look at it. But the more I did look at it, the more I could see uh, stories from my own life that had been impacted by narcissism and by psychopathy. And um, yes, to make a, a very long and complicated story fairly short, that's how I got to be where I am today. Mm, thank you. Thank you. As I was reading through your book, I could resonate with your story in so many aspects. One was the, the boarding school, but also the martial arts. Um, I studied karate at boarding school. And then I got into Aikido, just kind of studied that for the last couple of years. And um, what, nice. did you, what did you find? What, what's, what have you learned from the, the martial arts? What's kind of... Um, I, think my, I think my first lessons were very brutal ones. Like I, I, was, I was forced to do martial arts when I was a kid mm -hmm. growing up in Portugal because I was seen as like a, a, a wimpy, hypersensitive child. There was no such thing as... Um, you know, saying, oh, this child has is an introvert or this child is just highly sensitive. This was my parents went down for that. They're like, there's something wrong with this kid. He doesn't want to fight with the other boys. <laughs> he doesn't want to play competitive sports. 
he reads too many books. He's he's too much into poetry and philosophy. Let's harden him up. So they sent me to uh, to the local Shito Ru karate instructor, a guy called Jose Verissimo in Quatera, um, who's still around. I actually spoke to one of his, his sub instructors uh, just six months ago because he, he converted the old dojo into a gym. And then I did spirit combat jiu-jitsu. And we began sparring, just light touch sparring. And I started to get into it. And then I was sent to boarding school at the age of 12. And it was a, it was a nice boarding school, but there were some tough farmer's kids in there. And it was, it, there was violence. There was violence and there was bullying in the school. And um, I found that I could use what I'd learned uh, to stop being bullied. And as a as a 12-year-old kid who's a fish out of water, I was raised in Portugal, and then I'm in a quite a religious, strict environment that's quite, as I say, it's quite violent, full of bullying. Mm-hmm. Um, it really was like having a superpower because, and you got I got a reputation very, very quickly. Uh, like you can bully the other kids, but not that one. He might, he might, he might put, he might give you a hip throw or an arm lock. <laughs> so um, that was my my first sort of experience, and then I then went on uh, at age fifteen to start aikido and ninjutsu, both of which are. Uh, strongly rooted in Japanese mystical traditions. Mm. Um, and uh, the teacher I had for ninjutsu, I was very lucky. So the teacher I had for ninjutsu was Bryn Morgan, who trained, he's based in Birkenhead, he was based in Birkenhead, who trained directly under uh, Dr. Masaki Hatsumi for years and was known as one of the best in Europe. And I also trained under uh, Sensei Terry Ezra, who is the, is the best in Europe for, or one of the best in Europe for very traditional uh, Japanese Aikido and he runs like a full school of Zen meditation out of the dojo does Japanese drumming Japanese chanting Japanese healing systems he is immersed in that culture so I was very very lucky and that opened up um, the possibility of exploring uh, more of an eastern uh, philosophical perspective obviously until that point I've been raised with Greek philosophy and, and Christian Western Christian philosophy so that's that's what martial arts gave me in brief Mm, thank you beautiful beautiful so i'd love you to segue into just talking about narcissism you know what is it Mm. and also codependency how these two kind of link with each other Mm. um there's a kind of a politics to narcissism uh, with a small p as an internal to psychology and internal to the flourishing online space which is becoming ever more popular year by year to keep it simple um, and to use our Eastern martial arts philosophies. We could say that narcissism is a highly yang perspective of the world that is rigidly yang that is switched on. So the narcissist is always pushing out and forward and always demanding the reality bend to its will. The codependent would be rigidly yin. And they are constantly in reception mode. They don't do anything. They don't have any self-assertiveness. And they exist kind of as a ghost in their own lives or as a a, a ninja furniture mover in a Japanese kabuki play. They just dress in black against the black background. You're not supposed to see them. They're just there to be of use. Um, and so that's that's the easiest, or that's like a very simple way of viewing narcissism and codependency dynamic or narcissism and echo, if we want to continue with the Greek mythology. There was Narcissus, the beautiful male hunter who fell in love with his own reflection, and there was Echo, the poor nymph, um, who was condemned to fall in love with Narcissus. And in some versions of the uh, myth, she dies along with him because he can't tear himself away from his own reflection, and she can't uh, cease to stop trying to tear him away. And so they, they, they end up dying together tragically. Thank you. That's a very concise way of talking about narcissism because I've obviously I've kind of studied a lot the last few months, but before I wasn't really sure what it was. That's been mm. helpful getting a deeper understanding. How prevalent is narcissism and codependency in current society? Current society and current culture is highly narcissistic and highly codependent. Um, we are sick. We are sick. We live sick lives based on sick coordinates and sick prerogatives. This is our culture. Our civilization is not a culture that's in expansion. It's a culture that's in decline. And there are um, multiple 
pieces of data points that you can draw from that show that we're, we're no longer growing, we're now shrinking. Um, and narcissism and, and codependency aren't really the cause of that as such, but they're symptomatic of, of that decline. Um, I think it's important to just to just put the, the, this footnote in here. When I say narcissism, I am sticking to the orthodoxy of the American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So I'm talking about narcissistic personality disorder. I don't think it's particularly useful to talk about narcissism outside of that because, and this is what confounds the issue. So if you go online and you listen to YouTube videos, you'll hear so people will say narcissism, but some of them mean actual clinical entity NPD. And some of them mean people who had high and trait narcissism, but these are not the same entities. Everybody has latent narcissism. Everybody has a narcissism score in their personality for trait narcissism. Um, but NPD is actually a psychotic break from reality in which the person who's, who's developed NPD in their presumably horrendous childhood has activated a full psychotic delusional grandiose defense and they live in a fantasy land. Anybody who interacts with them, they'll only permit long-term interaction with people who enter their psychotic delusional grandiose fantasy with them. If you refuse, you're kicked out. So I just want to make that distinction because um, when when the space is filled with with talk of narcissism and they mean narcissism light, I don't think it's very useful because narcissism light can be dealt with by by therapeutic intervention. Narcissistic personality disorder cannot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And percentage wise, you talk about this in your book. What percentage of people do you find have this NPD? Just to put it in context. Uh, if you look at the UK population and you took anybody at random and you were testing them for um, being high in trait narcissism or high in um, codependent beliefs and behaviors, you're talking about 95% of the population. I think it's, I, I genuinely think we're like, definitely in the West, this would be true. In the Anglosphere, in the Western world, this would be true. Actual uh, levels of NPD. Um, the clinicians tell us are, are at three to five percent, mm -hmm. which doesn't sound awful, but you know, f if it really is five percent and five people out of a hundred are living inside of a delusional, grandiose fantasy space in which they're doing a massive amount of destruction to everybody they're in contact with, it means that if, if each five, if each of those five out of a hundred is in contact with 20 people, then the entire 100 people is affected in some way by narcissism. You, 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 it's, it's then become inescapable. There's no oasis away from narcissism. We're all dealing with narcissism either directly or, or indirectly at that point. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm segueing into like leaders and narcissism. Obviously, a lot of my work's around boarding school and the trauma of boarding school. And then mm -hmm. when we look at how many of our leaders have been to boarding school. So I'd love for you just to describe, talk a little bit about leaders and narcissism. Is that something you see in leaders, you know, in the UK, maybe more so or what? what? I'll, I'll, I'll keep it. I'll keep it to the UK because the UK is what I know. Mm -hmm. But I am aware that there is a similar and deliberate copying of the UK culture. It's in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, America. Um, there are countries that have also copied this. And I think it has, it's historical. It seems as though at a certain point in UK culture, and then it, it leaked out into the whole Anglosphere, a decision was made that we needed strong leaders. And at the time that the people were making that decision, how do we create strong leaders? The men who were in positions of power who made that decision, a lot of them were suffering from PTSD themselves. So they'd been beaten as children and they considered that completely normal. They'd been treated very severely. And many of them had been either to war or they'd engaged in some kind of a state sponsored violence. They were either involved in, in colonialism or battles here and there. So they had a 
by my standards and probably by your standards and today's standards, a highly narcissistic and psychopathic worldview. And there was a belief that still exists to this day. It's around. It's it's still there in the um, we see the echoes of it in the uh, medical institution where they're training young doctors that traumatizing people strengthens them. Traumatizing people is a good way of initiating those people into a brotherhood. Um, that traumatizing people makes them better at their jobs. Now we're more psychologically literate. We know perfectly well that just isn't true. It isn't true. Now you do need resilience and you must test people because they do need to be mentally mentally and emotionally strong. But, but you do that through stress, not through trauma. And so I think uh, the boarding school system is highly uh, rooted in uh, a military perspective. And the purpose seems to be to create narcissistic, psychopathic people who make the kind of leaders that they wanted to see. So they were narcissistic psychopaths. We said, we're evil lizard people. We want to see more evil lizard people run the world. Let's make them. Um, so I, I, I see the point you're making. and I'm, I'm in full agreement with you. Like uh, Boarding school, generally speaking, will make uh, for a, a effective, if your idea of leadership is bullying people in submission. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, over the podcast, this is the 73rd. I've interviewed many people who've studied this around the world. And yeah, the, like the history of boarding schools. Originally, it was founded by William of Wickham to support the poor, poor children, but eventually it got taken over. Um, so, you know, it was meant to be, I think uh, Winchester was, it had to be at least 50 boys were, uh, it was free. But gradually that got taken over um, and that's no longer the case. Um, yeah. And I mean, could you talk a little bit about your boarding school experience? You talk about it in your book. I mean, yeah. how was it for you? Obviously, you grown up in Portugal, running around, being quite free. And then suddenly <laughs> you were put in this institution near Taunton or something. Well, in, in Taunton, yeah. Queen's College, Taunton. I mean, I was... I didn't realize what a privileged youth I had. I mean, my memories of my youth were, yes, as you say, running around free. By the time I was 10, 11, 12, um, I was quite tall. I'd already hit like five, six, so I could pass, but older. And my friends were like 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. They had cars. Uh, we we all collected around, it was in Villa Mora, and we all sort of collected around a place, a sports club called the Rock Garden which interestingly enough is where I met uh, Christian Bale, uh, Batman. Um, his parents would go there. And he he actually, as a young theatre kid, he sang there a couple of times and performed there. Um, and so we were, it was kind of safe. And we were just permitted to just be with each other whilst our parents, I don't know, played tennis and, and drank in the sun, uh, essentially. So yeah, my childhood was sunshine and girls in bikinis. That's what I remember. Was just gawping at beautiful Portuguese women on Falasia Beach <laughs> and let my mind get warped from a young age. Um, and then I was thrust into this environment. It was tough, but it wasn't it wasn't that tough because the environment I was in in Portugal was for all its freedom, um, it was it was quite violent. There was organized crime around. Uh, one of my sisters uh, it's, it's not very nice, um, but it is a matter of historical record. My sister's best friend uh, at age 10 was killed in a fairly horrendous manner. Um, and they, the general belief is because that was over an argument over a timeshare deal. Um, and they, they, didn't, they didn't just kill this 10-year-old. They, they did things to her first. Um, this is all people can look, can look this up. That's actually, this goal was from Collegio de Villamora. Me and my sister at Collegio de Villamora. That was my sister's best mate. So there was fear there, like fear of real violence. Uh, when they were putting pressure on my father, one of a girlfriend of mine who was 14, she was walking from the rock garden up to my house and uh, two guys uh, shoved her into a car and terrorized her, drove around for 15 minutes and then threw her out over an embankment where she rolled down a bankment, an embankment. Nobody had mobile phones then. We just didn't know where she was. She just turned up crying with 
with with grass in her hair. They didn't do anything to her, but they they terrified her. So when I got to boarding school, it was very tough, but it was all I was quite mature for my age. And it was kind of bewildering. I was like, wow, everybody's so grumpy. And I would laugh when they would scream at me. And that would ins- they would go insane. They would go insane. Grannon, do as you are told. And I'm like, what, what is it that you want me to do? What, what, how can I help you? What do you need? For- and I would talk to them like this. What do you need me to do? <laughs> because I wasn't scared. They would, they would go berserk. So I, I, at first, I experienced fairly extreme punishments that had not been seen in the school for a while. I had um, a housemaster because I because I, <laughs> I didn't want to go to PE practice. But I just stayed in the school. I, I was a reader. I just stayed in the school library and read. And so he thought the best way to break my will would be, be to get me to run around the house, uh, the, the Jack Tig house in the rain. And he kept me out there for three hours running. <laughs> <laughs> one of the house one of the other house masters took a dislike to me and he, he he stood me out and he stood me out for eight hours like I was a 13 year old kid and I was made to stand staring at a wall for eight hours so there was there was a lot of that going on and then I was very interested in psychology though and uh, I'd already been in sales seminars with my father and my mother because they worked to sell people for uh, just different timeshare places in Portugal and I was like a little precocious. Um... Do you ever see the film There Will Be Blood? I've heard it's violent, so I haven't watched it. <laughs> it's 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 not particularly violent. Uh, it's violent emotionally, but it's a brilliant performance by Daniel Day Lewis, who is a narcissistic psychopath. But he adopts um, a young boy simply so that when he walks into business meetings, he can seem like a human being. He can seem like a normal man, but he he doesn't care about the boy at all. So I was brought into these sales meetings and business meetings so I learned how to talk to people and so I was like oh well these these are adults same as adults everywhere and inside of six weeks uh, I manipulated them and had them wrapped around my little finger and then I think as well they realized I wasn't I wasn't trying to cause disruption I just didn't know how to get by and my memories then after that were idyllic like boarding school was wonderful and I was actually given a special permissions in a way like i got caught multiple times sneaking over into the girl's house and watching tv with the girls <laughs> nothing happened no, it was really weird it was like i could i, I was like uh, i could dodge the raindrops kind of a thing i think they gave up i think they gave up on disciplining me they were like oh, he's a weird kid just just let him go so it was tough i'm not gonna lie it was it was very very tough but once i'd uh, figured out how to keep people calm and happy it became uh, a wonderful place but I did look at other kids who were 13 who were not as equipped as I was. Mm-hmm. Some of them were in, were in hell. They, they just were in hell and they, and they just couldn't cope. They didn't have a clue. Some of them were born victims uh, in, 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 in the sense that I, I wonder sometimes there's like a DNA component. You put some people in hard conditions and they just spiral down. And there's no advice you can give them. There's nothing you can do. They just they just spiral down. And a lot of the kids they just they just couldn't cope. They just couldn't they couldn't deal with it because it was it was frightening. It was it was frightening. It was frightening if you believed the threats were real. It was frightening if you bought into it. But if you didn't buy into it, it was kind of pathetic in in some ways. Mm, mm, mm. Nice. I would never send my children to boarding school, and I wouldn't I wouldn't advise it. I wouldn't advise it. Unless, uh, unless you've got you've got kids who are really really keen on joining the military, and even then, I'd say they should be fourteen. They should be fourteen and up if they're going to go into a military academy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that's what uh, um, Donald Trump. He was at a military boarding school on age. Oh, was he? Thirteen. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. As soon as you start, I start researching this. Like Elon Musk, he was boarding school from age eight. He got thrown down the stairs. Um, Mark Zuckerberg. Was, is he? Was he in a South African boarding school? Yeah. Elon yeah. Musk. Yeah. What Wonder Kloop or something like that boarding school? Right. Um, Mark Zuckerberg boarding school. You know, obviously Donald Trump, Rishi Sunak, yeah. Richard Branson. Yeah. It's like, oh wow, this is interesting. There's a theme here. Tony Blair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So yeah. one of the things I've been fascinated, uh, you know, one of my favorite authors is um, 
this guy here. So I've really enjoyed yeah. reading, um, you know, it's Pete Walker's Complex PTSD. I've been enjoying reading your book, but also listening to some of your interviews. Love you to talk a bit about complex PTSD. What's the difference between PTSD and complex PTSD? Just to begin there. Yeah, well, Pete, Pete Walker's book is is uh, is the bible for me on on this one. Um, and I, over the years, I think I've sent quite a few people across to him to to, to go get that book. Um, he he he, out, he outlines it perfectly. I just think it's one of the best books on psychology ever written for for me um for what i want from a psychology book the identification of complex post-traumatic stress disorder was made in the late 80s by professor who's the um the boss can't think of the other word of the psychology department at harvard university Mm -hmm. and she was observing the the cluster of symptoms between uh, children who were raised in adverse conditions and combat veterans, and she could see a crossover. And so she posited the idea in either in a paper or in a book, I can't remember what it was called, uh, CPTSD. Um, and she was saying that there's PTSD, br- like broadly speaking, if I'm, if I'm painting broad brushstrokes, we can say that PTSD typically is rooted in singular incidents where it's highly likely that you'll remember visually, auditorily, physically, um, olfactorily, what you saw, tasted, smelled, heard, and felt physically with your body around a particular incident. And therefore, the triggers for those incidents will be specifiable and external. A piece of music, a particular color, the smell of something will trigger you back into that experience that has a a particular cluster of emotions. So that induces a flashback. Uh, flashback is a term that came from, I think it came from LSD use before it came from from the Vietnam War. <laughs> so people would start, their, their brains would start firing off the experience of psychedelics again, and they'd go into an acid flashback. And then we they started talking about that for combat veterans. They would say, okay, now you're reliving. For some reason, something's triggered inside of you and you're reliving an unpleasant and frightening moment of, of a traumatic moment of your combat experience. That's a flashback. The flashback is visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and emotional. And it's usually a predictable set of emotions that is associated with how you felt at the time of the incident or incidents. If you felt impotent and frightened and, um, I don't know, full of despair, then when you're triggered into that flashback, you're probably going to feel the same way. Okay. With complex post-traumatic stress disorder, the triggers and the symptoms and the pathology itself, like where this came from, is complex. It requires that a person be trapped in an environment across time where they don't have full agency, where they're at the mercy of external forces. It typically induces a kind of um, infantilization of the person experiencing complex PTSD, so it breaks boundaries. So when you think of like political prisoners or people who are facing psychological and physical torture across time, the boundaries that they have start to break down and they, they become like infants, which is why they can fall in love with their torturers. They can fall in love with the people who are abusing them and because they are, they're reduced to the landscape, the, e- the egoless, boundaryless landscape of a two-year-old. This was actually really well uh, portrayed in, in the fictional book 1984, really? where Winston is being tortured by... O'Brien, and he's he's filled with this overwhelming desire to hug uh, O'Brien, and he looks into his his old wrinkly judgmental face, and he sees nothing but love. Mm-hmm. Um, this was actually mirrored by experiences of people being to- uh, Soviet soldiers being tortured by the Soviet establishment. Mm-hmm. It's, um, Sorry to interrupt. Well, there, nineteen eighty four yeah. in Bessel van der Kolk's book, he said. He believed that uh, 1984 was based on his boarding school experience. Mm. I've never heard that before. Yeah, and I didn't know Vassal van der Kolk spoke of 1984. Yeah, it's uh, got it written somewhere in in here. I think page 100 odd. Um, he's talking about Balby because he 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 knew Balby, John Balby, and mm. 
uh, he talks, I think it's page 109 on The Body Keeps the Score. Mm. And he's just saying, Balby himself told me that such boarding school experiences probably inspired George Orwell's novel, 1984. Wow. Wow. Well, that's that's frightening because <laughs> these 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 experiences are mirrored by by uh, Soviet prisoners being tortured by their own, own people. I just finished a book called Life and Fate by uh, Vitaly Grossman. Mm -hmm. um, and there are long descriptions of the interrogations of Soviets if they've been denounced. So if, if somebody had denounced you, you then had to denounce other people. It was like you had to come up with another six names. It was like the, the witch hunts. Um, and of all the things they could do to torture you, <laughs> with the sleep deprivation and constant questioning was the worst. I would say that would be the thing that would break people the fastest. So I mention it because it mirrors being stuck in an environment where you cannot recover you cannot get your ego boundaries back you can't refresh your pressure 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 and everybody's ego boundaries break they talk of um 50 year old battle hardened generals weeping like children they just start crying like children because they're in, they've lost their minds they've lost they've they're, they're in psych, they're in psychosis lack of sleep deprivation induces actual psychosis and as quickly as 48 hours you can start to see symptoms of psychosis uh, slipping in so Complex post-traumatic stress disorder. We can't identify the triggers very easily, or we may, or we may never identify the triggers. We may never identify it, or the triggers may not be the color red or a particular smell or the sound of music. It could be context-based, and the mind of the person suffering is like, oh, the way the girl in the restaurant just took my order reminds me of the contemptuous way in which my father would dismiss my. <laughs> it's really. It's very tough. It's very, very tough. And then the symptoms are complex because the the client, uh, the subject isn't isn't experiencing, they're not reliving a moment. So they're not having visual memories of their father. They're not having auditory memories of their father treating them with contempt. There's no visual auditory kinesthetic memory there. There's just the feeling, oh, I'm impotent, I'm worthless, I'm useless. And so, you know, PTSD is awful. I've, I've dealt with both PTSD and CPTSD. PTSD is absolute torture. I'm not diminishing it in any way. But at least with PTSD, you can say this is because. This is because. This is because of that incident. Okay, I know what it is. When it's CPTSD, the subject is never thinking this is because. They just think they're crazy. They're like, oh, I can't buy a pint of milk without sobbing and <laughs> or going into a rage. or They, they experience it as, as, as a kind of craziness. So... What I've done in the past um, to illustrate it, as I've said, uh, you know, once I went to it, the first time I went to a shooting range was in California. It's called Iron Sights. And I tried two guns. I tried a 44 Magnum. It's a very long with a big heavy round and you fire it and it puts one big hole in the target. Then I tried a Beretta combat shotgun and that just fires these pellets out that shreds the target and it can cut it in half or leave half of it hanging. There are bits and pieces of incidents and responses to incidents. And there's all these little micro traumas throughout the system. It's so, and then the, the, the last level of complexity is the therapy is complex because are you going to try and pull out every single shard of trauma or are you going to try and deal with it holistically? It's, it's very, it's very challenging. It's, it's as an intellectual exercise, it's a fantastic challenge, but it really is a hellscape for the people who are suffering with it. Mm, thank you thank you it's interesting i reached out to pete walker because i was like oh i want to interview this was about three years ago and he says i'm really busy but he did say i think boarding schools are a major cause of cptsd and i'm like right interesting interesting <laughs> because i see that with my clients because one of the things on mind on their website they say you can't escape and i'm like oh yeah, yeah. that's the abcd of boarding school syndrome a abandonment, B bereavement, C captivity. We couldn't escape. You know, yeah. you, you could run away and then your parents would bring you back or you say yeah. you're homesick. So, yeah. Uh, one of the things I see with my clients a lot is the inner critic. And you talk about that in some mm -hmm. of your videos. I'd love you to share a bit because you talk about it again in your book. I think it's the, the second, uh, I've forgotten if you say the word, uh, in the last couple of chapters, is it demon? Yeah, demon number two, I think, the inner critic. So I'd love you to share a little bit about how do we deal if we've got a really virulent 
inner critic. How do you yeah. deal with that, please, Richard? Um, so the inner critic uh, is the term that we use uh, in therapy and in, in popular psychology as well for the superego, which is a Freudian concept. It's a poor translation. What Freud actually said was there's an ich, which is, forgive my German, it's very scouse, ich. <laughs> there's an ich, there's an I, and then Freud said the uber ich, which is the over I. So there's a self and then an over self. So super ego is actually a poor translation of just over self. It is the part that is responsible for conscience and morality. It says this is good and this is bad. It is made up of the internalized messages that the child got in their developmental years from zero to eight. These are introjects. So the child introjects the external messages it gets from the environment. It even interjects people. It takes them. And then the superego plays these messages. If the messages from the environment were generally helpful, you know, be a good boy, go over here, that's good, don't do that, that's bad. Generally, good enough, good enough parents, good enough environment, then you will have an effective superego, an effective uber-ich that will guide you through life and will keep you away from danger and keep you doing good things. And it's your morality that says, don't do that even though it feels good, it's naughty, it's bad, it's going to hurt you, do this instead. It kind of sucks, but it's good for you. Let's go ahead. That's a good superego. A toxic superego is, is based on an environment that was not good enough, where the child was either abandoned or they were physically se or sexually or emotionally abused, and they've interjected uh, abusive people and abusive scenarios, and then the superego is just this stupid recording device. It doesn't know. It has a job to do. And it just plays those messages again and again. And we call that the inner critic. Now, why do we call it the inner critic? Because it's the side of, uh, for some of us, we'll be like, you're stupid, you're worthless, nothing you ever do is good enough. So it delivers those as um, the interjects are then replayed as injunctions for people who want to know the, uh, the psychoanalytic theory language. These are, these are injunctions, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Mm -hmm. But they're negative toxified morality. It's an upside down morality. And if it's really bad, it's a morality that doesn't lead you to thriving and happiness and a good life. It's a thr it's a it's a, um, uh, a, a top, topsy turvy morality that leads you to self destruction. You asked, how do we deal with this? Pete Walker gave me some good advice via email. Um, I have a, a YouTube channel called Fortress Mental Health Protection, and I talk about this at some length there. So, the Yang side of Pete Walker's. Uh, combat advice for combating the superego is called angering where you identify the superego is uh, giving you negative excuse me you identify that superego is giving you negative injunctions it's behaving in a toxic way and it's telling you you're worthless you're a piece of shit and you say no i'm not going to listen to that and you become angry with the superego and you push back with passion that identifies uh, a boundary between you and the thing that is speaking. So you can say, this is not me. I am not saying this. The superego, the inner critic is saying this. The second thing it does is it enforces a boundary that says, I am of worth and I'm worth fighting for and worth protecting. Pete Walker calls it angering. I put that, I made it yin and yang. And Pete Walker said, oh, I like the way you made it yin and yang. That's kind of interesting. So I was like, cool. <laughs> um, so that's yang. That's how we attack. That's how we move forward. The yin side of it, I can't remember what he called it, it's, but it's nurturing and it's mothering. So what should the superego be saying? It's soft, it's gentle. What would a good, good, good enough parent say to a child? Instead of saying, oh, you messed that up because you're an idiot and you're useless, the good enough parent would say something like, um, you know, you didn't get it right that time, but it's okay. People make mistakes. I think if we per persevere at this, I think if you try again uh, with a little bit more practice and a little bit more, bit more patience, you're going to get a better result. So. You push back against the negative. You say, no, I'm not listening to you. I'm worth fighting for. I'll defend myself <clears throat> up, up yours. And then the other side, you say, this is what a child should hear. This is what the inner child should hear. You're doing okay, actually. It's just, it didn't work out that time. Let's try again. So you replace it with, with a good message. That yin-yang um, methodology uh, is simple. It's easy to remember. And it works pretty well. But people have to do it frequently um every day across a period of time for it to become natural and spontaneous mm. thank you thank you that really resonates with me i'm part of my story is in my 20s i had a breakdown I was working in the city and eventually ended up in a buddhist monastery and nice. had a uh, for about three years I, I had a complete meltdown 
but the inner critic became very you know hateful and it used to repeat to me you're a piece of shit and i started to self-harm um and in the end i kind of imagined this father figure around me and just holding me and saying beautiful words and then it i just could cry and that was the beginning of the healing that you know starting to challenge that inner critic um, yeah. because oh yeah you know when it started i just you know go on for days and yeah um yeah. and eventually i found being creative as well just giving almost space for that energy to to, to create yes know, yeah create creativity seems to really help seems to really help yeah robert moore talks about that bit in his book the lover archetype uh the lover within saying you know when we paint it's almost accessing especially with images or colors that almost pre-verbal state and i mm. definitely found that to be very healing you know just to be able to access that yes yeah it definitely helps definitely helps mm -hmm. so another kind of area kind of linking these two aspects in you know you talk a bit in your book about consumer capitalism you know narcissism codependency just mm. kind of wondering if we you know we're looking at individuals but if we look back at society and looking mm. at that but what can we do I talk about consumer capitalism because I'm a Marxist revolutionary who drinks <laughs> uh, Starbucks Mm. <laughs> I think um, communism is delusional, um, and that Marx was a was a fantasist, but very intelligent and a brilliant analyst. Mm. When he was pointing out what was wrong with capitalism, it was brilliant, and it had never been said before. It was genius. It's just that his solution that he offered, um, I, I think, I think is completely unworkable. So he predicted uh, alienation. He predicted commodification of everything. Mm -hmm. In some ways, um, he predicted what concepts that were then developed by uh, Baud Baudrillard um, a century later that we would end up worship worshiping symbols rather than uh, commodities themselves. So we now have a simulation of a simulation of a simulation. And I think, you know, it's... When I was at university, I didn't like my psychology degree because I was doing behavioral psychology, which I thought was almost useless. But one of the electives was called systems thinking. Mm -hmm. And I did that and I really enjoyed it. And what I like to do when I'm analyzing situations is I, I create like a game inside my head. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, if everybody, if there's a hundred people inside of this controlled space and they're working off these paradigms and then we run the simulation forward a hundred years, where are we going to be? Well, if you run a simulation inside of your head of what would happen to 100 people existing inside of a microculture where the top level priority was consumption for its own sake, like consumption before God, consumption before community, consumption before humility or spirituality or grace, you'll create hell. When people are focused solely on consumption and they consider themselves as consumers, I lose people at this point. I know I'm losing like 80% of your audience right now because like, this sounds like ideological Marxist uh, uh, theoretical ramblings. We are all consumers. What is a consumer? A consumer is one who takes, mm. but that's not what we are. We can be that, but that's half of us. We're also creators. What in this, consu what in this consumer capitalist culture is rewarding creativity? We're like, oh, I could be a content creator. Yes, of garbage of absolute garbage and it's garbage that's rewarded in the online space it's the most crass the the most vulgar and that which reinforces the coordinates of consumer capitalism when you're a content creator is that which wins and everything else that's authentic and genuine is is, is ignored we have to wake up from this nightmare we are not solely consumers and consumer capitalism is locking us into materialism Yes, we have that inside of us. It wouldn't work if we didn't. But we've always had that inside of us. We've always had the love of the, of, of the flesh and of the world and a material pleasure inside of us. But every single spiritual system that was ever developed anywhere in the world warns against that. 
and says, don't do that. Here is a discipline to pull you away from the magnetic gravitational force of the material because we are not just material beings. And if we reinforce an ideology that says that we are, we become depressed. Because what are you? You're going to eat shit, fuck, eat more, drink alcohol, snort some drugs, play video games and die? That's a nightmare. And then, oh, be happy. Oh, you're not happy? Here's a pill. Who would be happy in, in, in that environment? We've never, we've never assumed that that would make us happy because in living human memory, I, I, I'm with Graham Hancock. I think we may have done this before. There may be civilizations that came before and died. Like if, watching him last night. Actually. <laughs> oh wait, yeah. I, I think I think like if we really were here with all of these faculties and all of the resources and the environment, and it's not two hundred thousand years; it's a million years that we've been here for, which is. That's what the latest anthropological data suggests. It's not, we as we are now are not 200,000 years old, we're a million years old. Then it's highly likely that civilizations have come before, but let's leave that to one side. In this civilization, we don't remember that. We don't remember it. We've always had, um, a, as far as we know, in, in our memory, uh, uh, low resource environments, very, very few options for what we can consume. And so basically we've never been here before. We've now, we're now the victims of our own success. We were starving for 10,000 years, for 20,000 years, for a million years. We were being beaten by the environment. We were being beaten by wind and sun and our kids being eaten by jaguars and we we're being bitten by snakes. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had dentists? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had 24 seven medicine? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had Starbucks coffee and whatever flavor you want? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had 4K streaming pornography and we could just wank all day? And because we were starving, and we, we suffered. We were like, yeah, that would be amazing. That would be heaven on earth. Well, here we are, kids. How heavenly is this? We're not evolved. We're in a poor, we're in an environment that's a poor evolutionary match for the creatures that we are. And we suffer. We suffer terribly. And I think it's time to just say in all due humility, okay, guys, we won the game, but we didn't know it would lead to this. We didn't know it would lead to so much despair let's put the brakes on this thing and let's start looking at some other options for how we should live rather than just making this blanket. Like there's no pushback. It's, we just leave it to the PR men and the advertising men who are like, this is how to live. This is your new religion. This is your new philosophy of life. Consume and pleasure yourself. How awful. I mean, it's, it's satanic. It's, it's evil. It's, it's, it's demonic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. It's interesting. I kind of, I've interviewed quite a few um on my podcast about the archetypes and they say the difference between the boy or the immature and the mature forms is the immature form it's all about me you know yeah it's the consumer whereas the yeah. mature form is service and yeah. we are serve so yeah. you know as we start to wrap up today i'd love for you to share some solutions what do you see moving forward say if you're you know on the individual level but also on a, a wider level, what can we do? What do you see happening? Sometimes I do formal meditation where I'll sit in uh, Seiza, the Japanese kneeling position, and I'll sit there and I'll do it properly. But typically, I just walk and I'll just go to a place that's quiet and I'll just I'll just sit down like normally, not not kneeling. Um, and recently, I was doing that. I was walking and I sat down, not kneeling, and I had this phrase that came into my head, and it was brilliant and simple. But I was like, that's so brilliant and simple. You're definitely going to remember it. And I forgot it. But it was something like, it was something along the lines of teaching people to embrace blissful nothingness. It wasn't that. It was better than that. But I, I refused to write it down. So there it is. And I, my solution would be to say to people, like, something like, give me, give me 20 minutes. Give me 30 minutes of your time. There's something else here. And when you, when you come with me, and I can take you into this space for 15 minutes, 10 minutes. You will, you will be so happy. You'll be happy in ways that you can't currently imagine because you're locked into a frequency that's greedy and resentful. It's not your fault. You're, you're indoctrinated that's greedy and resentful. And it's hellish. In this other space that you can access quite quickly, you don't want blissful nothingness. You want blissful somethingness. You want pleasure. You want to be the biggest and the best. And you want to post yourself on a on a yacht on Instagram because your mind is warped. It's, it's completely corrupted. But if you come and sit with me on a bench 
by the docks here in Liverpool, you'll I can I I believe I can tune you into another frequency just for a short period of time, where you can go ah, oh, this, it's this, I can be in my body, and not suffer, I can be in my body and I can be in the moment, and it's amazing, everything is perfect. And through that space, you enter like a frequency of gratitude and your gratitude that you have, you, you just feel grateful. I have clean socks on. Mm -hmm. I don't need to post pictures of myself on a yacht in Dubai on Instagram because my socks feel amazing against my feet. I can breathe fully and deeply and I can hear the birds singing. This is amazing. And there's nothing else. And I don't need anything else. If you've not lived it, it sounds kind of like, wow, what is this? Are you on drugs? Like, <laughs> what are we talking about? Who wants nothing? You offer nothing. That's never going to sell, baby. You're never going to, you're never going to get a million followers offering nothing, but it reduces suffering. And this is where I fully maintain uh, the Buddhist roots from adolescence. The goal shouldn't be pleasure. It should be to reduce suffering, <laughs> just reduce suffering, just embrace sanity and be at peace and you'll see it's 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 more than enough it's more than enough and when you slip into that for moments at a time you realize how much you're really in pain the rest of the time all this stuff on social media the the political stuff the wrangling the screeching that's people suffering they're they're in pain they really are in pain and they lash out in this you know hellish torture that they're enduring and they're crazy with pain they're completely crazy with it mm. Beautiful, beautiful. I was reading last night the last page in your book, and you mentioned about nature as well. Just turn your iPhone off or your smartphone off and get outside. It's like, yeah, maybe I'll come and join you, sit on your bench. Yeah, just sit on the bench and, and just look around. And it's mm -hmm. it's okay. It gives you, it's like sleep. It gives you, we need to reconnect at least for a period of time every day so your mind isn't in traffic and emails and everything else. The book goes into um, Islamic philosophy quite a lot um, because when I was in Malaysia, they, they were they were trying to get me to convert. So I studied and there is that it's it's very, very similar when um, in, Isla in Islamic culture, when they're praying five times a day, the correct way to view it is five times a day. They're taking a rest. They're taking that in Islam. It said we're taking refuge in God. Mm. We're just letting we're just taking refuge in Allah for a period of time. We're trusting in God. We're trusting in a higher force. We're acknowledging, because Islam means submission, I do not call myself into being. Mm -hmm. And I think there is this like heavily yang Western mindset, which is I'm in control. I'm doing this. I'm I'm making this. And it's exhausting. Yeah. With that Islamic view, you go, I'm I'm summoned into being by a force mm -hmm. higher than me. And I submit to that. I fully submit in all due humility. I do not summon myself into being. A higher force summons me into being. And if that force ceases to summon me into being, I will cease to be. And nobody will remember me. Reality will stitch itself back together perfectly behind me. No one will have remembered by name. But for some reason, I'm continually summoned into being. Perhaps, perhaps I could explore the possibility that there's meaning in that and that there's purpose in that. And I'm supposed to be here. And instead of that awful existential uh, despair and depression, you think, my God, maybe, maybe I am being summoned into being for purpose. What would my purpose be? And that's a gateway that opens, that leads you away from hell and into heaven. Because then, as you said, you look for service. Mm -hmm. You look at service. You look at purpose. You're like, there's, it's more than just me. There's people out here. There's other people here suffering. What, how does it make me feel if I, if I reduce other people's suffering? Does it feel good? Does it feel bad? Do I feel connected? Do I, and that's, that's what I would like to see people attuning to more so that they just suffer less, so that they're not so stuck in, in the material, which is a game that we all lose, by the way. Everybody's losing it. Elon Musk, Zuckerberg, you can't win. It doesn't go anywhere. There's no there there. There's nowhere to go. You just will suffer more. Beautiful, beautiful words. So how do people find out more about you, Richard? They mustn't. I'm a terrible man, and I'll only aggravate them. Um, there's my book, which is available from Jeff Bezos's Capitalist Slave House. Uh, it's called A Cult of One. 
Um, or they can search Richard Grannon on YouTube and they'll see that I have, because I'm a grandiose narcissist, four different channels running on four different subjects. <laughs> I have so much to say that I'm just covering everything. <laughs> well, I do do recommend people read uh, read the book. It's really great. Um, I Yeah, could resonate so much with so many of your stories uh, in there. So bless you for your work. If I can support you in any way, you know, please do let me know. You know, even if you, you want a bit of a um, stillness on the top of a, a Yorkshire moor in West. That sounds York. lovely. Yeah. That sounds you know, nice. If you live right, right on the tops and Hebden Bridge, please come and, come and visit. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. <laughs>